Hello there everybody, welcome to my beginner's guide for Dune Spice Wars. I'm Icon and in this video I'm going to wrap up everything you need to know to enjoy this game. As usual you will find the timestamps for this video in the description box below, so if you're looking for some topic in particular, go check them out. And before we really get started, this is based on early access version, so this game will develop, this video will get outdated and I will remake this video once it is necessary and enough development has been made. With that out of the way, let's do a quick summary about the game. Dune Spice Wars is a classic real-time strategy game which follows the 4X formula. Explore, exterminate, exploit and expand. Depending on your playstyle, the order may vary. So your job is to get dominance on the desert planet, get spice, the most precious substance in the universe for the Emperor, get rich and dominate the, the rest of the game. So depending on how deep you are in touch with the sci-fi literature of Frank Herbert, this will more or less be familiar to you. If you're not familiar with the sci-fi franchise, don't worry, this game is still fun. In general, you're sitting on a desert planet, your job is to mine out the most precious drug in the universe and all these other dudes that you can play, four factions in total right now, are competitors to you and your job is to be the boss of this planet. Shortened version, grossly shortened, but it'll work for you. So let's get started with the first topic and that's going to be the user interfaces and the menus that you see here because this game has a lot in store for you and we're going to explore everything step by step. Now. Up here you see your own faction. When you click this dude you get your faction and the other factions shown. You also get an overview about the relationships between each other. I'm going to go deeper into what these things here mean later when we talk about hegemony or you just step forward to the time mark for that. Next to this are your counselors. You can select them when you begin a game. There's four different counselors and you can select two of them per match. This whole bunch of um, icons here is your spice income. Here's your spice income. This is the ratio, how much you want to sell, how much you want to stockpile. Over here you see the, the exchange ratio. So here you see how much uh, money you get per spice and here's your stockpile. Down here you see how much imperial tax the emperor wants from you and here, here you have it practically all I just explained in one text box if you don't want to interpret all the the icons up here here's the rest of your resources Solari is your money behind that is your income of that the green number it means positive red number means negative just wanted to point obvious things out Plascrete is your building material basically every building you construct on a rock is needs Plascrete manpower well the name implies everything it is you need it for troop recruitment for military buildings all manner of different things fuel cells are necessary for vehicles in general some buildings also need fuel cells but mostly this is the resource necessary for vehicles water well water is everything on a desert planet you need water for annexing villages which are basically your outposts and you need water to supply your military and next to that is your authority that's necessary to annex new villages because you know no authority no annexion and behind that you have your Lanzarote standing. This is a little bit more of an obscure thing that I'm going to explain once we go into the Lanzarote itself. Over here you have the icons of the other factions. You click it and then you go into a diplomacy menu with uh, nice people you like your good old friend Vladimir Harkonnen and you can just select all the other dudes with that. But below that are your espionage operations going to explain that once we are in that topic. Here's your research menu, here's your Lanzarot menu, here's your espionage menu, and here's your units. Harvesters, ornithopters, which are basically your scouts, and military, which is all your military, your army. And in the center of all this you have, of course, the planet itself, but I guess you already guessed that. Everything in this game is clickable, well, and once it's, when it's highlighted, and you always get pretty useful pop-ups when you mouse over different aspects use it so 
that's the user interface. Let's get into the next chapter, which I flag basic expansion. So your first job is to get a spice field under your control. And this, this topic will show you basically everything alongside of that. So your ornithopters, you can just select them and right click them. Okay. Let's go. And up here, I forgot to mention that, is your hegemony score and your time setting. You can speed up or slow the time depending on how you want it to. And most importantly, there's the date. And below the date is a tiny little bar. And once that bar is full, there there is another Our day vector. over. And that's basically the ticks of the game. On the move. So when you okay. fly over these sections, as you see, you're uncovering the fog of war. And once the question mark pops up, you just right click it with the ornithopter and then he starts scouting it. You can just set them on auto recon, then they'll just do their job on their own. I'll highly recommend you to do this once you feel like you don't want to hand control them anymore. But at the beginning of the game, it is quite powerful to hand control their every step because they are rather dumb. So now you have uncovered your first village and your first spice field. To, uh, to gain these, you'll have to conquer these people. So let's hire some troops. Click yourself down here, and over here you see your uh, different units. Troopers and rangers are the units that the Atreides have access to early on, and all these other units need to be unlocked via new technologies. For now, we're just going to gain get ourselves one trooper and one ranger. And as you see here, we can't recruit anything else because we have only two recruitment slots. So let's speed up this whole thing. And as you see here, you also have a limited amount of command points. I'm going to explain how these troops work in detail in the, in the military um, part of this video. For now, my personal favorite approach is to go with three units, not only two game wants to send you out with two in the tutorials I didn't like that way too high losses and put your people together here and once the last dude is trained we're going to attack that little village your troops all have special abilities and it's really worth reading them every unit is unique in its own regard every faction has unique units that work a little bit differently and knowing how your units work is extremely important for every faction. Overall, each faction has a very unique playstyle. Okay, so let's just right-click this thing, the rest will happen alone. There's two things that are important to know. That yellow bar below your troops are their supplies. Once these go down to zero, your people will starve to death, so to say. So keep your operations short and spicy. And from time to time, something like that will happen here. The sandworm is nearby, and also shown up here. People with the exclamation mark must be selected and move until the exclamation mark is gone. If not, they'll just get eaten by a huge massive sandworm. In this game, everything which does produce noise attracts sandworms, and if you attract sandworms, you just die. Um, I, I went a little bit quickly over that. So you get this uh, flag icon when you when you uh, kill off every unit and you need water and authority for for doing things. So, so about the water. Water is a reserved amount, so my army needs water to work, and every village you annex also needs five water to be to be working out and that's that's what we needed to do for the basic expansion so now we're sending the ornithopter to explore more i'm going to go for auto recon because i'm lazy you also can order them manually to go somewhere even if they are on auto recon and after your command they'll buzz by and do more and now we got that down this is the basics of how you expand first you you, you scout it out with the ornithopter, and then you send your troops over there. And as you see here, the supplies got refilled because we are under control of that area, and our people are getting healed now as well. So that's very, very important to know. And in general, every one of these regions, here you see, has one village, and if you're lucky, something connected to them. Every one of these circles also means... This village is connected to this to this supply. This village is connected to whatever that is. 
All right. So let's talk about villages a little bit next. So as you see here, the number here is the amount of total militias supplied there, zero. And my my big big um, recommendation there is always always have your villages supplied with militias because there will be just random attacks and if you don't have enough militias in your in your villages they'll just get killed and that's a bad thing beyond that villages are extremely important for your uh, for your expansion here in a village you can build stuff and every village comes with two building slots to begin with and you can build economic military or Plum statecraft is a very vague term, but it's mostly diplomacy focused. That's espionage, Nansarad, diplomacy, or or technology. These three things are intermingled in statescraft. And another thing that's very important to know about your villages is every region has its own wind strength. The higher the wind strength, the more water you can get out of these because the basic way to increase your water income is via wind traps. Wind traps produce water per level of wind in the region. There's also another method to gain water, but that's very mu that that's much more exclusive. So you want to look for regions that have a high wind power. Four is already high enough to to justify the construction of a wind trap. Every building, as you see here on the left side, are the construction costs amount of, uh, of product and time in days and the other side upkeep is what it will deplenish from your income the first thing that you're going to build is a refinery and that's what i'm going to get into uh, in the next topic but there's really not much more to know about your villages beyond that they provide building slots they provide you the the majority of your production will happen in villages like there's buildings for plascreed buildings for fuel cells buildings for water buildings for manpower production and so on and so forth just read the buildings and you get behind it really quickly the most important things to know to, to know about villages are two building slots per village every village will demand five water and you really really ought to protect them with militia or your own people everything else i just don't want to spoil with that explore it to, at your own leisure so next chapter spice gathering so first of all you need a refinery you can and should only build refineries and sectors that have a spice field and as you see here we're now building that thing i'm going to send my troops over to the next area and conquer the next village because there's really not much that we need to do here. Always keep an eye on your troops when they are fighting because they're, the gunfire can always attract sandworms and playing around the sandworms is extremely important in this game and can immediately turn the tide of battle. You see also the ripples below the surface where the worm is ought to be. This is a really cool randomization element in this game, and I really like that. Really, it keeps you on your toes. Now, taking control of a village, there's one thing to note. The more villages you control, the higher the cost in authority. Every subsequent village that you capture will, will be costier than the one before. So that's really important. So now we see that there's a refinery being built. And as soon as that thing's ready, we can finally harvest spice. This is extremely important to get that going as quick as possible, because this is one of your main sources of Solari income, and the Emperor will be truly, truly angry if you don't manage to fill your supplies. Okay, so with the construction of a refinery comes the harvester. The harvester... Enable auto recall must be on, on at all times, and after that you just click the deploy button. This is extremely important because the harvester's sound and noise will attract worms, and from time to time you need to just uh, get him back and redeploy him afterwards. That's a little bit annoying. Whenever a sandworm happens and the auto recall triggers, your harvester will be 
AFK afterwards. You just need to click him and redeploy. I don't know why, but it's just like that. Last thing worth knowing about spice harvesting, harvesters can be increased, can have crew, and increasing crew increases the, uh, the income of that thing. And as you see here, there's a maximum amount of crew here, and crew slots can be increased via various ways among these research, and since there's really not much more to know about how spice refining works, we can go there in a sec. But first off, I want to explain here this a uh, little bit more thoroughly. So what's really useful to know, what I really enjoyed was... Here you can adjust how much spice should be sold and how much spice should be kept. When you go here into the spice report and you change the slider here, it immediately shows you where your stocks should be at for the next tax, so you can balance it out to your own liking. And if the prices here get crappier and crappier, you might want to increase your reserve. Just such a just as a, as a thought, and I'm going to talk about uses for spice beyond paying taxes and selling it later in the diplomacy section. Now let's talk about research for good. So once you have conquered your first village, you have access to research. I have delayed that a little bit because too many things at once. So research happens with this icon here, and this is your research menu. Research is roughly clustered in the blue tech, which is mostly statescraft, the green tech, which is mostly exploration tech, also very water-based um, techs. The red ones are mostly military, and the yellow ones are mostly economy. One thing is worth mentioning, every tech that's that has your, your faction's logo on it has been reworked because you're playing that particular faction. So every faction has unique technologies, so to say. You can only research alongside of the tree, and whenever you mouse over something, you get the explanation for these technologies. Every one of them is quite deep and does a lot. And what's really important to know is here, technology would take around five days to research. Every subsequent technology will take longer. This system of subsequently increasing costs is something that the game does a lot. So this means your decisions matter. So you can force some technology down here quit pretty quickly because the costs will be low if you just beeline towards one tech. And the more you want to spread out, the costier, the, the higher tiered technologies will go. Pretty nice and complex system, and it's really, really fun to play around that. Technology can be gained by building new research hubs, or generally there are technologies that give you knowledge, for example here, knowledge per controlled village, and there's various other methods of gaining knowledge, but you get the idea there. So the next thing we need to talk about, because there's really not much more that I want to talk about here is the espionage system. So espionage, as you see here, it doesn't happen anything yet because we don't have any agents. Agents will be recruited after some time. So as you see here, this yellow bar is marking how quickly or when your next agent will arrive. And you can speed up the fill, fill up time of this bar via different technologies. For example, here, spying logistic gives you 100% quicker agent recruitment speed. There's different ways if you want to play espionage. So, now let's get into that menu. Looks a little bit intimidating, but it's really not that, that, not that hot. Up here we see our agents. Every agent has an own trait, so you might adjust your operations for that. To use your agents, you just left click them once and then the slots where you can put them over up. So at th these are all the options that where you can put your agent. Counterintelligence, well, goes without saying, does, inc does increase the chance of snatching other agents. Here you can set your agent to infiltrate other factions. And here you can set up your agents to infiltrate the planet Arrakis in general, the Spacefaring Guild, the Choem, which is basically the Spice Traders Guild, and the Lanzrod. This is all a little bit abstract at first, but easily understood like that. Wherever you put your agent, 
you gain different bonuses. So for example, putting your agent on Arrakis gives you a plus one on authority per, uh, production, a plus one on intel production, and you infiltrate Arrakis. So the infiltration level is filling this bar down here, and every time the bar fills, the infiltration level goes up by one. What's that good for, you might ask yourself? I'm going to get into that in a second. So here you see every branch here gives you other bonuses. So Choam infiltration gives Solari production, Space Guild infiltration gains manpower production. So there's different bonuses to be gained. And the faction infiltration is only good for a heavy intel production. I'd highly recommend beginners to go for a deployment on of one agent into Arrakis first, because this unlocks authority increase, which is really good for expansion, but also this way you can use your agents to inspect wreckages like these here. So you need an agent on Arrakis infiltration duty to, to, go, to go for this uh, option here. The other option would be to just uh, send an ornithopter there, but if you want to go for these options, you need one. And also the bonuses of the Arrakis infiltration are really good. So once you have gained enough intel, you get the option to set up missions. Missions are one-time spells, so to say. So 50 intel can be transformed into a probe setup. Grants vision on the region and recons its points of interest. Additional production of villages is visible. So you can use 50 intel to unlock this operation, then you will get it onto the, in this button, and then you can use it once and the operation is used up then and you need a new one. There's lots of different option, operations there, and some operations need a, different, a certain level. So for example, poison water supply reserves needs at least a level 1 Arrakis infiltration level, and that's why you need all the different spots. That's roughly how the espionage here works. It's mostly about gaining bonuses, producing intel points, and plotting new missions. This goes up until uh, to the assassination of faction leaders. Haven't tried that yet. So I hope that helps you out. The next thing we're going to explore now is the Lanzrad. So the Lanzrad is something that opens up after a couple of days, as you see here. The next council will start now in two days. Down here below the Lanzrad icon, you see your influence and your votes. These are two different things. Your votes are something you get for every every session of the Lanzrad, so to say. So every time a voting will happen, you have 100 votes, no matter what. Up above there is your influence. You can use your influence in addition to your votes. So, ah, it's going to take a while. So I'm going to explain all that um, on a different save file because it's going to be easier like that. All right, since it takes a couple of days until this menu shows up, I went over to another save file. So you can use here your votes and your influence to vote for certain things. Your influence will get used up. Your votes will refresh every cycle. So it's a little bit of a game of pushing harder into a certain direction. Each one of these resolutions here does a certain thing. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. So for example here, tax negotiations is a positive one, which will lower the Zolari upkeep for everybody. Negative resolutions usually are aimed towards a certain house and can be used as a means to weaken enemies. You always get to decide how many votes you put into one direction, and your influence will be counted as votes at this, at this regard. Up here you see also different charters that can be activated once certain things have happened. So for example, you can call out for a speaker of the council as soon as 20 resolutions have been accepted, and 2,000 influence have been spent total in votes. That's what needs to happen to unlock this thing. And once it is unlocked, you need to have at least a certain Lanzarote standing and influence, the total amount of influence spent to be eligible for the election of that Speaker of the Council thing. 
So there's lots of other um, options here. So judge and the water cells union and the Dune governorship, which, well, if you are governor for 60 days, you will produce a political victory. So this is basically your ways and means to win diplomatically. Over here, you see how many votes every party has. And very important to know, there are minor houses. This is AI controlled votes. And this means even if you don't do anything here, there will be a lot of turbulence in diplomatic uh, regards. So as you see here, Here's one that went to the House Atreides, and here's one that went to the House Arconan. That's the dudes I play. As you see here, 99 miners have voted for that, and 110 have voted for me, uh, came from me myself. So here in the diplomacy menu, there's a couple of things worth mentioning. First off, this is a method of buffing yourself and debuffing your enemy, and it also is a method of gaining new new options of, of influencing the game. So the Water Cellar Union, for example, produces more money in relation to the available water. So there are lots of different strategies that you can go for, depending on your play style, including a diplomatic victory. Keep in mind that the other factions will hate you a little bit for acting against them, so use that wisely. All right. So next chapter, I want to talk a little bit about the military in this game. Every unit here has a couple of stats. Power, that's their attack power, HP, armor, and supplies. So it's pretty simple, but I wanted to explain it real quick before I go over to the next chapter. So basically said, this is the amount of damage a unit does per attack. This is the amount of uh, damage that it gets reduced per attack, and as you see here, the militia units can reduce the armor of that. Your military will always require command points. If these are used up, you can't recruit any extra military troops anymore. Every unit also needs upkeep in terms of money and manpower, and therefore you are limited in money, manpower, and command points for your military options. Whatever you do, I already explained the thing with the sandworm. It's really important that you keep that in mind and also always keep an eye out on your supply um, meter here. If that runs out, your people will almost immediately die and you can save yourselves by running into a different um, area there. What I also want to mention was extremely powerful. Among the military buildings, you find the missile battery. Zoom out here and go for the airfields filter. Um, no, oh, well, it doesn't really show up here well. But the the missile batteries allow you to shoot. Ah, here you see, every combat that happens in this circle here will be backed up by those missile batteries. Also, a pretty good thing to use. Beyond that, well, check out your troops. So, uh, your troops perks, and after that. Choose among the stats and see for your uh, for what's good for you, and always keep an eye out on the enemy troops. Check out their stats, their HP, and their skills, and have some fun with that. Not much more to say about that. The military system is, in my humble opinion, quite easily understandable. So next thing I want to talk about is the capital. So we need a little bit more hegemony for that, and we also have that. On this save file and once you reach 2000 hegemony you're allowed to build stuff in the capital oh wait a sec i'm going to retake that and show you what's it's like once i have that point here we go just thought like sorry that was um when i record when i saved this it was at the proper points whatever now capital has different building slots than your average village. You only have one capital and therefore you have to choose wisely. You also have these strange clusters here. For every building that you build in these clusters, you will trigger these bonus effects, which is quite simply explained. If you build one building here on this slot out of the economy, out of the economy sector, you will gain one stack of this bonus. If you build 
one building of the military block, you will gain one stack of this bonus. If you build one economy building on this slot here, you will gain one stack of this um, of this bonus. So it's really important to know that this only counts for streaks. So you can't go for one military, one economy, one statecraft, and just uh, pick the cherries. If you want to have this bonus, you have to fill in three economy buildings in this slot. The really interesting part about that is some bonuses can be gained multiple times. So complete a district with one economy building to gain one stack of this bonus. So you could easily build three economy buildings in this thing here and build the fourth one in that one here and gain that one that bonus twice so all these buildings here are quite massive need a lot of money time and upkeep and usually you should really really adapt the building of these on your play style i don't want to spoiler too much about that i don't i just want to explain how these mechanics here work so all in all Check out which bonuses you want and strive for that. Every district is limited in its amount of building slots, so you have two districts with three building slots and one with two and one with one and two with one, and that's about all you need to know about the capital. It unlocks once your hegemony score has reached 2000 plus. More about that in a minute. So next thing I want to talk about is the diplomacy. So diplomacy works pretty simple. You see here the relation level, which increases by going for positive interactions and decreases by negative interactions. And over here you can trade with these guys. So here's what we uh, what we offer, and here's what we want from them. So basically, here for example, I offer some plascrete, and I want some spice for that. And as you see here, this meter is showing whether or not this guy is going to take that deal or not. You also can um, propose treaties. Research agreement gives knowledge. Trade agreement increases salary, production, and so on and so forth. You see where this leads. And that's, this is pre pretty much all you can do with the Let's other business. AI factions. Trade-wise, I'm sure there will be more impl implemented in the future, but for now, that's all I can say about diplomacy in this game. There are no direct war declarations or anything, but if you attack the people, the relationship level will decrease and they will start attacking you as well. Alright, so let's go on to the final and last chapter for this video, the Hegemony Score. The Hegemony Score is basically your, your total score in terms of winning the game. As soon as you have 25,000 of that one, well, I'm pretty sure you win the game by that. I haven't played until this point myself yet. But it's not only that. You see, you gain Hegemony out of different operations there goes without further explanations but also gaining hegemony unlocks more more power-ups for your factions so at 5k the Harkonnen faction unlocks new powers and at 10k as well so this is true for all the other factions so the higher your score the more powerful your your faction traits will grow so going quickly for these um, scores is definitely interesting and appealing to you you can check the list here controlling regions defeating units and all the things are methods of gaining more power there and the more you have, the easier it is to win the game. So, I hope that was kind of helpful for you. Drop me your comments down below. If you have any further questions, just ask away. Leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed. And of course, consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. There's daily content coming up from my side. And there's hundreds of videos to browse between. So, I'd be super happy to have you. And, last but not least, check out... The description box not only for the timestamps but also for my twitch channel if you want to see me streaming i'm quite regularly on it and last but not least i'd be super happy if you'd check out the ways of supporting this channel i do all my work for free and i'd be super happy if you'd had a look on it be that as it may i wish you a wonderful day and have a good one and see you soon bye bye